Henry George Day Devotional, episode 31. We embark upon week 7. We continue with book 2, Population and Subsistence, and chapter 2, Inferences from Facts, where we're looking at a bunch of facts from George, from history, trying to dissuade us of the Malthusian doctrine that proposes that population outpaces subsistence. We've been in China and India, and now we go to Ireland. Ireland, of all European countries, furnishes the great stock example of overpopulation, the extreme poverty of the peasantry and the low rate of wages there prevailing. Side note, Henry George was more popular in the UK and Ireland, at least initially, than he was in the United States of America, I think. Back to George. The low rate of wages there prevailing, the Irish famine and Irish emigration are constantly referred to as a demonstration of the Malthusian theory worked out under the eyes of the civilized world. I doubt if a more striking instance can be cited of the power of a pre-accepted theory to blind men as to the true relations of facts. The truth is, and it lies on the surface, that Ireland has never yet had a population which the natural powers of the country, in the existing state of the productive arts, could not have maintained in ample comfort. At the period of her greatest population, in 1840 to 1845, Ireland contained something over eight millions of people, but a very large proportion of them managed merely to exist lodging in miserable cabins, clothed with miserable rags, and with but potatoes for their staple food. When the potato blight came, they died by thousands. But was it the inability of the soil to support so large a population that compelled so many to live in this miserable way, and exposed them to starvation on the failure of a single root crop? On the contrary, It was the same remorseless rapacity that robbed the Indian Riyat of the fruits of his toil and left him to starve, where nature offered plenty. A merciless banditti of tax-gatherers did not march through the land plundering and torturing, but the laborer was just as effectually stripped by as merciless a horde of landlords, among whom the soil had been divided, as their absolute possession, regardless of any rights of those who lived upon it. I don't have a great uh, knowledge of the Irish potato famine, but I trust George implicitly. It was the landlords who owned all of Ireland. Let's see what else he says. Consider the conditions of productions under which this 8 million managed to live until the potato, potato blight came. It was a condition to which... The words used by Mr. Tennant in reference to India may as appropriately be applied. Quote, the great spur to industry, that of security, was taken away. Unquote. Cultivation was, for the most part, carried on by tenants who will, who, by tenants at will, who, even if the rack rents which they were forced to pay had permitted them, did not dare to make improvements which would have been but the signal for an increase of rent. Labor was thus applied in the most inefficient and wasteful manner, and labor was dissipated in aimless idleness. That, with any security for its fruits, would have been applied unremittingly. That's right, people work when they get what they work for. But even under these conditions, it is a matter of fact that Ireland did more than support 8 millions. For when her population was at its highest, Ireland was a food-exporting country. Even during the famine, grain and meat and butter and cheese were carted for exportation along roads lined with the starving and past trenches into which the dead were piled. For these exports of food, or at least for a great part of them, there was no return. So far as the people of Ireland were concerned, the food thus exported might as well have been burned up or thrown into the sea or never produced. It went not as an exchange but as a tribute to pay the rent of absentee landlords, a levy wrung from producers by those who in no wise contributed to production. Yes, the, the English landlords. 
Had this food been left to those who raised it, had the cultivators of the soil been permitted to retain and use the capital of their labor, cap, the capital their labor produced, had security stimulated industry and permitted the adoption of economical methods, there would have been enough to support in bounteous comfort the largest population Ireland ever had, and the potato blight might have come and gone without stinting a single human being of a full meal. For it was not the imprudence of Irish peasants, as English economists coldly say, which induced them to make the potato the staple of their food. Irish immigrants, when they can get other things, do not live upon the potato. And certainly in the United States, the prudence of the Irish character in endeavoring to lay by something for a rainy day is remarkable. They lived on the potato because rack rents stripped everything else from them. The truth is that the poverty and misery of Ireland have never been fairly attributed, attributable to overpopulation. McCulloch, writing in 1838, says in Note 4 to Wealth of Nations, The wonderful density of population in Ireland is the immediate cause of the abject poverty and depressed condition of the great bulk of the people. It is not too much to say that there are at present more than double the persons in Ireland it is with more than double the persons in Ireland it is with its existing means of production able either to full able, able either fully to employ or to maintain in a moderate state of comfort all right sorry I uh, botched the reading there a little bit apparently this McCulloch guy is a big Malthusian all right George responds to this as in 1841 the population of Ireland was given as eight million one hundred and seventy five thousand one hundred and twenty four we may set it down in 1838 as about 8 millions. Okay. Thus, to change McCulloch's negative into an affirmative, Ireland would, according to the overpopulation theory, have been able to employ fully and maintain in a moderate state of comfort something less than 4 million persons. Okay. That's what, that's what McCulloch is implying. Now, in the early part of the preceding century, when Dean Swift wrote his modest proposal the population of ireland was about two millions as neither the means nor the arts of production had perceptibly advanced in ireland during the interval okay between 1838 and whatever the early part of the preceding century was i guess the early 1700s nothing had been invented much so then George says, if the abject poverty and depressed condition of the Irish people in 1838 were attributable to overpopulation, there should, upon McCulloch's own admission, have been in Ireland in 1727 more than full employment. Ah, so he's, he's going back in time. He's saying if McCulloch got his wish in, that, in the early part of the preceding century, there should be more than full employment and much more than a moderate state of comfort for the whole two millions. Yet instead of this being the case, the abject poverty and depressed condition of the Irish people in 1727 were such that with burning and blistering irony, Dean Swift proposed to relieve surplus population by cultivating a taste for roasted babies and bringing yearly to the shambles as dainty food for the rich 100,000 Irish infants. I guess this was a scathing political essay of ridiculousness. I don't know. I don't know about that, Dean Swift and eating babies. But I take the point as in 1727, Ireland had 2 million, and they were living in great poverty. And then 100 years plus later, somebody saying they're living in great population because they have too many people. And at that point, they had... 8 million and that and McCulloch says McCulloch says 8 million is too many if we had half of this we had 4 million everyone would be really well off and rich and then George says if you think that then why in 1727 when Ireland only had 2 million why weren't those 2 million living with tons and tons of food around because they were not all right that's my summary back to George it is difficult 
For one who has been looking over the literature of Irish misery as while writing this chapter I have been doing, to speak in decorous terms of the complacent attribution of Irish want and suffering to overpopulation, which is to be found even in the works of such high-minded men as Mill and Buckle. I know of nothing better calculated to make the blood boil than the cold accounts of the grasping, grinding tyranny to which the Irish people have been subjected, and to which, and not to any ability of the land to support its population, Irish pauperism and Irish famine are to be attributed. And were it not for the enervating effect which the history of the world proves to be everywhere the result of abject poverty, it would be difficult to resist something like a feeling of contempt for a race who, stung by such wrongs, have only occasionally murdered a landlord. That's, that's a good paragraph. No further comment. We continue. Whether overpopulation ever did cause pauperism and starvation may be an open question, but the pauperism and starvation of Ireland can no more be attributed to this cause than can the slave trade be attributed to the overpopulation of Africa, or the destruction of Jerusalem to the inability of subsistence to keep pace with reproduction. Had Ireland been by nature a grove of bananas and breadfruit, had her coasts been lined by the guano deposits of the chinchas and the sun of lower latitudes warmed into more abundant life her moist soil, the social conditions that have prevailed there would still have brought forth poverty and starvation. How could there fail to be pauperism and famine in a country where rack rents wrested from the cultivator of the soil all the produce of his labor except just enough a living wage, maybe, except just enough to maintain life in good seasons, where tenure at will forbade improvements and removed incentive to any but the most wasteful and poverty-stricken culture, where the tenant dared not accumulate capital even if he could get it, for fear the landlord would demand it in rent, where in fact he was an abject slave who, at the nod of a human being like himself, might at any time be driven from his miserable mud cabin, a houseless, homeless, starving wanderer, forbidden even to pluck the spontaneous fruits of the earth or to trap a wild hare to satisfy his hunger. No matter how sparse the population, no matter what the natural resources, are not pauperism and starvation necessary consequences in a land where the producers of wealth are compelled to work under conditions which deprive them of hope, of self-respect, of energy, of thrift? Where absentee landlords drain away without return at least a fourth of the net produce of the soil, and when, besides them, a starving industry must support resident landlords with their horses and hounds, agents, jobbers, middlemen, and bailiffs, an alien state church to insult religious prejudices, and an army of policemen and soldiers to overawe and hunt down any opposition to the inquitous system? I don't really remember why that, que why that sentence was a question, um, but uh, it's... Yeah, yeah. Is it not impiety far worse than atheism to charge upon natural laws, misery so caused? <laughs> so the worst, so it's pretty bad to call someone an atheist, but uh, calling them impious for, uh, for, for being poor and starving when they have to support horses, hounds, agents, jobbers, middle and bailiffs, um, is pretty pretty unfair so the question in this long sentence was no matter how sparse the population, no matter what the natural resources are not population and starvation necessary consequences that's the question in such a state yes population and pop pauperism and starvation are necessary consequences in a land where you cannot save up and you are having to support all of these other entities. 
what is true in these three cases, I assume that's India, China, and Ireland, will be found upon examination true of all cases. So far as our knowledge of facts goes, we may safely deny that the increase of population has ever yet pressed upon subsistence in such a way as to produce vice and misery. That increase of numbers has ever yet decreased the relative production of food. The famines of India, China, and Ireland can no more be credited to overpopulation than the famines of sparsely populated Brazil. The vice and misery that come of want can no more be attributed to the niggardliness of nature than can the six millions slain by the sword of Genghis Khan, Tamerlan's pyramid of skulls, or the extermination of the ancient Britons or of the aboriginal inhabitants of the West Indies. Any questions?